until now, I have never really lived. Life on Earth is a creeping, crawling business. It is in the air that one feels the glory of being a man and of conquering the elements. There is an exquisite smoothness of motion and the joy of gliding through space. It is wonderful. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second day of the Italian Aerospace Park Conference. I'm Captain Andrea Patassa, and I will be your host for today's event as well. Yesterday, we had a fruitful discussion about the critical role of air and space power in modern warfare, and how it can be a driving force for the development of new technologies and a stimulus for the industry. Our panelists and keynote speakers share their insights on topics such as the integration of new space capabilities, lessons learned from the Ukrainian conflict, new organizational approaches, just to name a few. Today, we will continue on the same spirit as yesterday and build up on, on the discussions of yesterday. We have another lineup of sessions that will focus on the doctrine of air, of air and space power and the role of future aviators. Before we begin with the discussion, I would like to remind to those attending in person that before each panel, you will see a survey on the lead wall behind the panelists. You can use your smartphone and scan the QR code that you can find on the back of your pass and cast your vote for the survey. At the end of the discussion, the results will be presented on the lead wall and our experts on stage will analyze the results. Let's now start with the first panel for today. The third dimension is becoming the ultimate battlefield, with air and space power reigning. Without it, victory is near impossible. In this panel, we'll explore the evolving doctrine of air and space power, drawing on real-life examples to identify the most peculiar aspects of future warfare. Come fly with us into the future of air and space power. For this first panel, our experts on stage will debate the doctrine that should guide military decision in, uh, in a technologically revolutionized environment and the lessons we can learn from recent operational theaters. The moderator for this panel is a faculty advisor and researcher at the NATO Defense College, where she focuses on diplomacy, foreign policy, political violence, radicalization, and international security. 
Prior to joining the NATO Defense College, she was a Max Weber Fellow at the Political and Social Sciences Department and an Associate Researcher at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute in Florence, as well as a lecturer at Sciences Po in Paris. She received her PhD from the École des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris and has held teaching and research positions in political philosophy, comparative politics, and international relations at various institutions worldwide. Her previous research affiliations include the Institute for Strategic Studies at the French Ministry of Defense. It is my great pleasure to invite Dr. Cynthia Salum to the stage. Thank you very much, Andrea. Good morning, everyone. My pleasure to be here today on such an important panel discussing doctrine. I would like first and foremost to welcome my very distinguished host on this panel this morning, Gregorio Aleggi, historian and professor at the Luis University, Major General Gabellini, Italian Air, uh, Air and Space Operations Command, Tom Goffus, my NATO Assistant Secretary General for Operations, and General James Hecker, Aircom Commander. Last but not least, very distinguished General Ushikura for uh, the Japan Air Self-Defense Force, its Chief of Staff. Welcome everyone to this panel, please, let's get seated. We have spent a good amount of time yesterday talking about the centrality of air and space power. We've also discussed how much Ukraine as an operational theater is putting again at the center uh, air power and space too. Today we will discuss doctrine and beliefs. This includes also air and space power beliefs, but also systems of systems integration and multi-domain operations. I would like us to remember one thing, to keep in mind that even the most sophisticated doctrine has to be translated in operational realities. And these operational realities are not only our own. Our adversaries and enemies have a vote in them. And this is something that would, would be a sort of a red line through our discussions, hopefully, today. So which are the beliefs that should inspire military decisions in a technology revolutionized environment as ours? I am very confident that all of our panelists today will give us uh, really precious answers to these issues. But before we start, and as it's been now uh, let's say the, 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 the use here since yesterday, we're gonna please uh, show on the screen behind me the question to the audience, the survey. As you see, we have uh, tried to do interactive, uh, let's say, um, thinking with the room and have our panel discuss some of the outcomes of the survey. And today, this morning, is going to focus on multi-domain operations. And the questions go uh, as such. Effective multi-domain operation requires an innovative new infrastructure paradigm accompanied by simultaneous doctrinal and cultural shifts. So which do you think is the real enabler for multi-domain operations? Is it a new command and control with battle management structure? Is it a new mindset? Is it a leading service? Obviously, it would be the Air and Space Force. Or is it a new multi-domain service? You can scan on your little tag uh, the code and cast your votes, and we will get back to the survey a bit later. We are going to start with Professor Aleggi, uh, with the host country, actually, Professor Aleggi, followed by General Gabellini. And I'm going to ask you, Professor Aleggi, about the state of air power in Europe today compared to 20 years ago. 
what are the limits of air power and coordination among nations in Europe, to start with? Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure and uh, honor to be here today on this important occasion. And uh, certainly there are some things which um, air power in Europe shares. We've seen air forces in Europe come down in numbers over the past uh, quarter century due to two effects, one a general impression of a lack of challenges and the other the huge costs of long operations overseas. So numbers are down and there is a conspicuous um, need for recapitalization in uh, many areas. And there's also probably a shared problem of doctrine. What are we here for? Uh, we always say that uh, we tend to refight the past wars and certainly the past the quarter century uh, was leading us in a certain direction from which we've had a rather abrupt wake-up call. So I think that is a problem. But there's also another problem inherent every time we use the word Europe, whether we would use it as, um, uh, it might have been in the past, as a geographical expression or as a political expression. Um, wanting to do things together requires a uh, shared vision of what the threats are, what the uh, goals are, and that then informs decisions, it informs the doctrine, it informs force structure. Yeah. And clearly, we have not made much progress in that direction. Much remains um, on a national level in which national visions and priorities prevail, and sometimes down to national, um, let's say, industrial considerations. Uh, we've seen that with the Ukraine, not just with air power, the many different types of equipment, the many different levels of decision which have slowed down uh, our help. So, yes, technology, yes, new concepts, but if we have many, uh, over two dozen different concepts, it is going to slow uh, the reaching of a shared a common doctrine. So, do I still have some time? Yes, you do, and I have okay. uh, a second question for you to follow. Okay, so um, just two things I think we should um, consider. One is we've been making progress on the more technical aspects. We've uh, been sharing certain capabilities, but not the, let's say, the sharp end. So certainly we can do more in sharing and pooling things, but eventually we'll come to the sharp end, which is where the problem is. Um, we can do a lot to prepare for it. Think of one of the most hugely successful European programs, the Erasmus uh, Academics Exchange Program. We could think of having that for military academies, having cadets spend six months somewhere else, knowing people really well, not just squadron exchanger things, but growing knowing mentalities. But at the end, um, we might say that uh, aerospace power is the continuation of politics with other means, and so we're back to square one, to politics. I think that the military have done an excellent job of knowing each other, working well together. We have shared, all of that works, but if we want to make the next um, jump ahead, which is uh, collective defense of Europe, we need to make one further step. And finding the doctrinal solution will not be the only and the only final answer. Mm -hmm. My second question for you is about Italy. Well, we're, we're here for the 100th anniversary of the Italian Air Force. I would be very interested in your view about the major gaps in Italian Air Force capability today, but also in air power thinking and doctrine. And I know you would have something to say about these issues. Um, thank you, it's a great, it's always the dream of the historian to be promoted chief of staff and to be able to say <laughs> what we need and so on. Um, I also feel a bit, uh, under test because there's several hundred of my former students in here who are probably trying to see if their old professor has lost it or is still sharp. So um, I'll put it this way. Um, the Air Force has enjoyed almost 30 years of a shared continuous vision which has allowed it to grow considerably. After a long uh, interval, Italy restarted real 
operations in 91. And since then, there's been a shared vision which has radically transformed the service at every level. Um, it, it just cannot be overstated. So at this point, we have a much smaller service with smaller numbers, but which much uh, higher quantity. There are significant capabilities, sometimes leading edge capabilities in many critical areas. Um, just think uh, F-35, Italy is the leading Euro nation in the European Union from F-35. Um, we certainly have the best uh, AEW platform in Europe and so on. Those are things which have been unthinkable 30 years ago. So that's the positive side. Uh, we have a leading edge uh, fighter training uh, organization, which has opened up internationally. In fact, I think there was some recent announcement. So th there's all sorts of positive areas. We have a problem with, like many others, um, numbers. Certainly, stocks need to be greatly replenished. We're running out of almost everything, so that would be the first item. We need to bring back um, combat aircraft numbers back to where they were before cuts in both uh, F-35 and Eurofighter procurement. Um, those are critical things. Then, as we move forward, we need ground-based air defense. That's been a significant um, capability gap for many years, and that needs to be addressed uh, sooner rather than later. Then we can go into the details. Um, we also have, thanks to this experience, we have not just, as we said, a coherent vision at the top, but we have junior and mid-career officers with a huge amount of experience, something which was just lacking. Uh, we basically ran out of people with combat experience around 1977 or 78. When I was a kid, I met the last uh, three and four stars who had actually fought in World War II, and then we had a 25-year gap. Now, what we need to do, I think, is to bridge the gap between the strategic top-level vision, which, as I said, has been very coherent, and the combat experience. And we need to do it much faster. Uh, the lessons we learn grow old very quickly. So we need to get these young people, their experience, into the cycle quickly. And I would add, we need to get it out more publicly. Uh, the Air Force has written some pieces of doctrine recently, but they're classified, and as they should be. But we need to do more public thinking, more communicating, uh, to bring out the key themes. Mm -hmm. uh, conferences like this are a first step, but we need something more public. Even, I would dare say, in... Um, in Air Force publications. We've gone a bit too much over to promotion and we've forgotten a bit of the nuts and bolts of the business, which uh, nobody has the right answer, but certainly the debate and the thinking and the sharing of experiences mm -hmm. is a good starting point to get an answer. Yeah. Your words inspire me a question for everyone. Maybe you can address it uh, a bit later in the discussion. You've mentioned just to say it bluntly, uh, rearmament, right? We, we are at a time where we are aware that we need to rearm, and the rearmament of Europe seems to be at the heart of all of our concerns and debate since the war in Ukraine. I would be very curious to know from the whole panel, how do you think uh, a rearmament of European nations, I'm thinking, for instance, of Germany, who has a lot to do uh, from that perspective, would affect changes in doctrine and joint doctrine, and it's including within NATO. I know Tom Goffis uh, uh, might want to uh, bring some answers to that later. But for now, I'd be very happy to, uh, to address Major General Claudio Gavellini. Um, General, I would be very interested in knowing uh, what are the changes in Italian air power and doctrine. And we're going to stay in Italy for a little while. Um, but also of Air Force missions since February 24th, 2022, since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Thank you, Cynthia. So first of all, let me thank my boss, General Goretti, for volunteering me for such a relevant panel. So thank you very much. <laughs> sir. It's, been a, it's, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, uh, so uh, talking about the major changes, uh, uh, let me start by also thanking General, um, Professor Alegi because he, when he was referring to young people, he was looking at me, so thank you very much. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I slightly disagree on what you just said on our doctrine uh, when, you, when you said that our doctrine hasn't progressed that much. 
uh, it's maybe true, but it's also the clear sign that the way the ARC2 construct has been set down for years, battle proven and combat tested throughout several conflicts, means that it's kind of a solid system. So it works pretty fine. So, and we're working on the Italian Air Force side on that specific aspect. In the, yesterday, I heard a lot talking about innovation, about new technologies, new system, new stuff which can be used by us. But I think that the, the driving factor of all these kind of processes should be the mindset. What we know, what we understand, the way we see and the way we think and we plan to use the, the military instrument in the future. And I think it's all about, it's all about doctrine. So doctrine is exactly that. Principles and fundamentals on how to use uh, the equipment that, that we've been given. So the Italian Air Force has been working quite aggressively on this side of the house. Uh, we laid down a document the professor was uh, referring to earlier on. It's a kind of uh, uh, something that has been mutated by NATO, sir. Uh, the RC2 CONOPS. So, so we laid down an Italian Air Force RC2 CONOPS, which is meant to gather all the RC2 related documents, put them together in a single holistic vision in accordance with the guidance of my, of my Air Chief. So, in order to be ready and responsive. And I have to say honestly that. Despite the fact that we, there, we're currently working to tweak our RC2 construct, and of course, to make it even more responsive to the new challenges, uh, what we see currently is that doctrine needs to be adapted, but we have to be very careful. Sometimes I hear, especially in the joint environment, I hear new fancy solutions, say, hey, we should do that and we should do that. The first question that I always give to my team is, say, okay, why should we do that? So what is the problem that we're trying to fix by changing our doctrine? Because if the problem is not clear, I don't think it's a wise idea to disrupt something that NATO and the Western world has been using since 1991. And it's been, as I was saying earlier on, it's combat proven. So we have to be careful when we think about changing the doctrine or when we try to give off-the-shelf solution for, for problems that have not been identified clearly. And especially I'm, what I'm referring to is that sometimes this kind of driving factor goes back to the last conflict. Um, we've been enjoying 20 odd years of uh, golden age in counterinsurgency. Wars fought far away from our homes, thousands of kilometers away from home, in a pure air supremacy environment without a real opponent. So this kind of driving factor is not there anymore. Ukraine conflict is bringing us back to reality, waking us up and say, hey, maybe we should get out of the comfort zone and start to rethink the way air power should be used. And it's all about doctrine. And looking exactly what's happening on the field in a Ukraine conflict, which is a huge amount of information for us. I mean, uh, picking up on what Sun Tzu was telling us 2,500 years ago. Learn from your enemy. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And what we what we're currently seeing is that if the use of our power is not in accordance with what we consider the pillars of it, then the failure is granted. There's no other way. I mean, you can have as many equipments as you wish, hypersonic missiles, satellites, fighters, bombers, long-range aviation, whatever you need. I mean, they have everything that I would like to have. The point is that, and going back to doctrine, and going back to competence, if you don't know how to use them, if the principle in accordance you're using those instruments are not the right ones, then you're, I mean, the failure is, is granted. So that's why we're currently working on the, on the competence of the Italian Air Force personnel, air crew, as well as ARC2 battle managers. A 360 degree approach, trying to provide them with a modern training tools, uh, in a live, virtual, and constructive environment, which, it, which gives us the opportunity to follow our mantra, which is train as you fight. So we're trying to do this in the more realistic way possible in order to be ready for the next war. But the point is that we have to be ready and think to the next war without forgetting what we learned for the past and being able to capitalize the, the major lessons identified from the past. The, the only point, and I, and I will come back on that, so I'm, I'm pretty straight on that. We have to be careful whenever I hear these new ideas, 
that we should change our doctrine or that we should rethink the way of using our power, kind of regionalizing our power, disrupting its integrity. The integrity of our power, the integrity and the shortness of the RC2 chain is the key of success since 1991. So whoever is thinking about changing the doctrine in this way, maybe you should rethink the process because that's not what's going to happen. And this is not what's happening currently in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I'm smiling, General, when I hear that uh, you qualify the counter-insurgency counter period of the 20 years as a golden age. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite sweet to put it this way. Uh, but I, I'm very grateful for, for these responses, and I want to take this opportunity because uh, our two speakers are the two European speakers on the panel uh, as such. And I want to bring in space a little into this conversation now. Uh, why is space a stake for Europe today, uh, in your opinion? And I, I wouldn't want you to have the whole load of responding to this question, especially in its second part, the objectives in the field of space doctrine, but also capability building, um, are not clear in a way that they do not necessarily prompt European nations like France, Germany, Italy and Spain to close their cooperation. What can be done about it? Especially that space is considered more of an EU capacity and prerogative today rather than a NATO one as such. And I speak under the authority of Tom Goff is here. All right, thank you. Uh you may, someone may recall the Star Trek TV series. Uh, it started to say space, new front, last frontier. Well, it's not last frontier anymore. So space is there, and we uh, are currently highly or completely depending on the space orbiting technology. So uh, we had to make up our mind quite quickly, and I'm talking about the Italian system. So when we decided that the airship decided that we should push and press on the space side of the house. Uh, so first of all, major, the major concern from a, from a national standpoint, then I'll come to the European side of the house, is that we have to be ready to address the threats coming from, within, and through space. And those threats can be either intentional or unintentional. So we always think about someone attacking us with missiles. It's not all about that. I mean, we could receive threats from space even due to uh, artificial or natural phenomena. Think about solar bursts, uh, which could disrupt our communication system, or think about debris, space debris. So the point is that if we are not able to protect our space capacity, our lives could go back to the pre-industrial age in a blink of an eye. So we should be really careful about that. The second point with space is that space is huge in the real sense of the term. So there's no single European nation capable to reach a kind of independence. That's why seven European nations uh, made up a kind of consortium and started a program, a very ambitious program in 2020, uh, trying to start to address several main issues with regard to space. So the first of all is an advanced space C2 construct, which could also lead us to a increased share situational awareness. In this regard, the Italian Air Force, uh, following my Air Chief guidance, uh, had to stand up in Poggio Renatico, where I command, a space situational awareness center, which means a center which is already fully operational, capable to uh, interact with external and internal agencies, and of course, when I say external, I mean also, I mean also international agency, European level, mm -hmm. to, first of all, to share the situational awareness. So we have to do more together. Uh, talking about space governance, there are continuous attempts to set up something which could lead to the terms of reference for the exploitation of LEO orbit, which is the most crowded, uh, crowded area in space. It's vital because whatever you want to put in, in space has to go through the LEO orbit. So you, you have to know exactly what is out there. And what I learned to my surprise is that whoever is trying to uh, send up a satellite, communication satellite or whatever, does not always have the awareness on what, what could be out there. And I'm talking about debris, other, other satellites or other stuff in space. So it's, it's vital, taking into account the huge costs of space enterprise, to know exactly what is there. So that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And this, this kind of 
increased shared awareness could, could lead to something which is similar to the air, air traffic system man management that we all know. So we're trying to work hard to, to build up a kind of space traffic system management which could help us all. But for sure, it has to be a, a real transparent and honest joint ent ent enterprise. Mm -hmm. So we have, to be, we have to work very aggressively on trust and confidence, mutual confidence, because I understand national agendas, but when we go down to space, I mean, when something uh, launched by men uh, take, for instance, the rocket, rocket bodies of Chinese rockets. I mean, they, they're building up their, their space station up there. They're using fire and forget rocket bodies. We're talking about 5,000 tons of metal coming back in the atmosphere. And they know it's going to happen. So our capacity to identify, track, and react is vital. Yeah. And it's not vital for a single nation. It's vital for all of us. Mm. Thank you very much for, for these responses. Tom Goffis, I'm uh, moving to you now, and there are a couple of points, if you are kind enough to come back to them, maybe at the end of your observations on European rearmament and changes in doctrine, but also on this question of space. But before that, I would like to ask you the question that uh, was prepared for you about principles and beliefs that, in your opinion, would allow allied forces to be the lead in air power capabilities and provide us with superiority uh, in the new fighting context? Um, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, uh, for the question. General Lant, uh, General Goretti, uh, very much appreciate the invitation to be here. Happy birthday to the Italian Air Force and congratulations on 100 years, 100 great years. Um, uh, great to see you again here in Rome, Luca. Uh, it, it's, uh, this conference is a reminder of uh, getting to meet with uh, old friends and how important relationships and trust are, as important, if not more important, than technology and uh, TTPs and the things we like to talk about. <laughs> These are as important as everything else. I think it's great. Um, it, those of you that read through the bios would note that this end of the panel is a little heavy on F-15 experience. <laughs> so if you hear common themes, uh, and of course Scorch is here, uh, and all of his instructor skills will come into play, and I'm sure he'll correct me to 100% where I go astray on this. Um, so doctrine, uh, it's what we believe is the best way of doing things based on experience and anticipation of the future. So I'll go the opposite direction that Professor Oligi went. Uh, he looked back and said, you can make mistake, mistakes by looking at the past. Um, U.S. Secretary of Defense Bob Gates is fond of saying that the U.S. has a perfect record in modern times of predicting when and where future outbreaks of war will occur. Huh. It is always getting it wrong. And nonetheless, we gotta look forward. And as we try to anticipate the future at NATO, we are right square in the middle of a generational change, a generational inflection point in NATO. And we are rethinking how we do business and how we adapt to the new Euro-Atlantic security environment. For two decades, NATO's challenges, NATO's problem set, NATO's thinking, um, as the general said, we're focused on out-of-area operations against a terrorist threat. And the threat had no air power. Nobody challenged our air superiority. We took it for granted. If you walked into uh, a U.S. F-15 squadron bar, there'd be a plaque on the wall somewhere that would say something like, um, no U.S. soldier has been killed by enemy air since April 15, 1953. Seven decades of air superiority. Mm -hmm. For the last two decades, NATO Air has focused on the uncontested delivery of precision munitions in a timely manner, and we got good at it, really good, but in an uncontested environment. Terrorists don't have aircraft. They don't have cruise missiles. They don't have ballistic missiles. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has changed all of that. Uh, in fact, after Russia invaded Ukraine the first time in Crimea, I was in Warsaw, and I was talking to a Polish general, and I said, hey, um, what keeps you up at night? And I'm talking to a general officer, and I'm thinking he's gonna tell me Su-35s, MiG-29s, um, something like Russian submarines or caliber missiles. He didn't even hesitate, though. He said, what keeps me up at night is that uh, Putin is willing to use military force uh, to achieve political objectives. That underlines our new security uh, dynamic, our new Euro-Atlantic security environment. Of course, they asked Secretary Mattis that at a press conference uh, when I was working for him. They said, um, 
sir, what keeps you up at night? And he said, uh, nothing keeps me up at night. I'm a Marine, I keep other people up at night. So we, we need to keep that mentality, I think, if we can. So uh, the other thing we do at NATO um, is obsessively we talk about escalation and de-escalation. Um, frankly, I just don't think that's the way Putin thinks about the world. I think he calculates in terms of strength and weakness. Avoid strength, exploit weakness. And if you use that as a framework for Crimea in 2014, it's not what we did that provoked Putin, it's what we didn't do. So NATO is now, again, focused on collective defense, where the enemy drives the timeline, not NATO, and where the enemy will actively contest airspace, both over NATO airspace and over enemy territory. With that in mind, uh, my top priority as the ops uh, division at NATO headquarters is to operationalize a new family of plans that are focused on collective defense and that are focused on dealing with a contested airspace environment. So how do we defend against terrorism and uh, Russia? How do we defend against those threats? First, uh, terror is still a threat. The epicenter has drifted south towards Africa, I would say, but it's still very present and very dangerous. We cannot afford to forget what we've learned over the last 20 years about how to effectively fight against terrorist groups. Skill sets that are needed to defeat a terrorist group, uh, they do overlap with the skill sets that we need to fight Russia, but they're not the same, especially the dynamic of operating in a contested air environment where air superiority is not guaranteed. Again, terrorists don't have tanks, fighter aircraft, or integrated air and missile defense, but as we see in Russia, or in, uh, in Ukraine right now, Russia does, and they're willing to use them. Despite the war in Ukraine, over 90% of Russian Air Force assets remain intact, as does their deep IAMD network. The silver lining of the horrific war in Ukraine is the golden opportunity to harness lessons learned. And I'll give you a few quick ideas of my own observations. And I know all the facts aren't in yet. We don't know a whole bunch of details about what's going on. For example, why is Putin willing to risk and lose tens of thousands of soldiers, 2,000 tanks, but an order of magnitude less of his aircraft? That risk aversion is something that I still don't quite have my brain wrapped around. Or how has Ukraine, essentially on a shoestring, mounted an effective air defense to keep the Russian Air Force on its back foot, on its heels. We have some good reporting out there, though, um, and I would commend to you the, uh, the Rusi report that uh, Professor uh, Justin Bronk uh, wrote. He was on the panel yesterday. It's called The Russian Air War and Ukraine Requirement for Air Defense. It's a little dated because it's back from November, but it's pretty good uh, anecdotal piece on how things are going. So in the air domain, I think there are two skill sets, uh, two key tasks that have atrophied among allies uh, and the alliance over the last three decades, IAMD and counter IAMD. First, on IAMD, we need to have the ability to defend versus drones, bombers, fighters, ballistic, and cruise missiles, the whole spectrum. If you leave one of those out and you look at Ukraine, you're in trouble. Mm. North of 6,000 missiles and drones have been launched at Ukraine over the last 15 months, destroying lives, apartment buildings, critical infrastructure, and military equipment. I think that uh, it's important to look at that because after I look at that, I do not see a commensurate or proportional sense of urgency to rebuild or right the ship or fix our NATO's IAMD capability. With over 300,000 casualties, on NATO's doorstep, we need to learn now. We need to course correct right now. Short of an Article 5 attack on NATO allied territory, this war in Ukraine is the biggest wake up call, the biggest call to action that NATO as an alliance is ever going to get. So if not now, when? If we don't fix our IAB capabilities now, then when? The iron is as hot as it's going to get, and we need to take advantage of that to get things done. We should look at IMD, all three pieces, and uh, being from the Air Force, it probably won't be doctrinally correct terms, um, but you'll get my drift here. Active offense. This is shooting the archer before the arrows come. It, uh, imagine if, if Ukraine could figure out how to target effectively 30 or 40 drones that are sitting in Crimea before they ever launch, as opposed 
to waiting, them, waiting for them to launch. So that's the first piece, active off offense. And then there's active defense, Patriots, NASAMs, SAMPTs. I really appreciate the European Sky Shield Initiative as a way of getting after that problem. It's a good step. Uh, and then third, and finally, we used to be really good at this, passive defense, camouflage, hardening, deception. Like I said, we were really good at it. We've got to get good at it again. Some of you in the audience remember the blow-up tanks we used to have that was intended for Russia to target. Uh, I think what we're going to learn from the Ukraine battlefield is that EW, electronic warfare, is an effective means of deception, and we're going to have to invest there as well. Um, I would say this, too. Over the last three dec decades, as the general said, we were focused on counterterrorism. While we were focused on counterterrorism, Russia was focused on full-spectrum warfare. So over that three decades, Russia has systematically invested in a missile arsenal intended to exploit a perceived lack of alliance capability in IAMD, a vulnerability. Putin decided to abrogate the INF Treaty starting in 2014 because he found a weakness to exploit. Simultaneously, over the last three decades, uh, while NATO IMD capability has significantly atrophied, Russian IMD capability has gone through the roof in complexity, in numbers, and in capability. Russia has built an elaborate IMD network that stretches from Kaliningrad to Belarus to Crimea now, and also Syria. Comprehensive, integrated, effective, but not undefeatable. We need to be able to degrade the Russian A2AD network along the eastern flank, Kaliningrad and Belarus for sure, in order to be able, be able to, to support and protect our allies on the eastern flank. On the battlefield in Ukraine, the Ukrainians can't take down the Russian IAMD and vice versa. It's an air superiority stalemate. The lack of an ability to gain air superiority, superiority when needed has sentenced both sides to a grinding artillery duel reminiscent of World War I. Especially from a Russian perspective, the inability to gain air superiority, the inability to suppress the enemy's air defense, has turned an expected three-day war into a 15-month and counting quagmire. Mm -hmm. So what should we learn from the war in Ukraine? Simply put, two things, IMD and counter-IMD. Air superiority matters, and IMD is a key alliance vulnerability that we are woefully behind in fixing. Remember, we gave the Russians a three-decade head start. We need to start fixing this now. And with over 300,000 casualties, I'll say that again, on NATO's doorstep, if not now, then when? And uh, so I think uh, on the space question, um, I think the primary, from what I've seen and, and, and what I look at, the primary cooperation is, is going to be initially on data on sharing data and how we share data and give permissions to do that kind of thing. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's my simple space answer. That's it. Thank you very much. Your observations and remarks lead me to address a question, but for later. It just would allow the panel to think about it. You've mentioned the air superiority stalemate brought by the war in Ukraine. And we know that Russia has been trying to keep intact its air force. I'm wondering what that means. Does it mean that air dominance would be crucial in the offensive? Or do you think there's an acknowledgement that air defense has taken a decisive superiority? But again, um, before uh, we, uh, we move to the next speaker, uh, and address this question with others, I would like to take just a small break to remind the room about our survey. So uh, remember, we have a question for you on multi-domain operations. I would please ask uh, the regia to show behind me the question again for your uh, information. Again, you need to pick one of these four options and we will take some time to comment the results at the end of the panel. With that, I would like to move to General Hecker. Um, there is already so much on the table, and I wish you could start by responding to all of the questions that were put forth by your colleagues. But before that, unfortunately, um, I would like to address you with the, the initial points uh, of speaking uh, that we were interested in uh, having you on this panel. First, uh, 
regarding roboticized air force, how to recognize and respond to the growth and spread of roboticized air forces and precision strike capabilities in air power strategy and doctrine. And in a second time, uh, in your 10 minutes, um, could you please give us your view on the examples we have of systems of systems application in real combat? H how could we assess the effectiveness of multi-domain operations, but also of uh, joint all-domain operations? Well, thanks. Thank uh, first, I want to say, Luca, happy birthday. <laughs> and you can throw a party. This has been, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks uh, for inviting us. And I'd also like to say congratulations to Cynthia, uh, who's going to be a mom in about three months. So Thanks. congratulations to you. Thank That's you great. very much. It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot to, to motivate us to do our job. When we have someone who's going to uh, have a baby girl in three and a half months, we want to make sure that they have the same opportunities that we had when we grew up. And we didn't make sure that we do that. And this is a pretty defining time that we have uh, on all of our nations to make sure that we get this right. So we have to be large advocates to make this happen. As we're lining up to walk up the steps, um, I was going to be third. And Tom Goffis goes, hey, I, I, think, uh, I think we're going alphabetically. Well, now I know why. is because he gave my speech. So good on him. And he... Just said, thank God for the alphabet, so okay. <laughs> so here I go. I'll, uh, I'll kind of pivot a little bit. Um, I'm going to go back to my old job. I didn't plan to do this, but uh, Air University. Um, one of the functions we had there was to write Air Force Doctrine. And I had really never read our Air Force Doctrine. And you know why? It was three volumes, and this is just basic Air Force doctrine, not all the other stuff. And it was 286 pages long. So I did a poll, and I went around and asked some of the people at Air University how many of them had read our doctrine. And I was getting a bunch of, you know, deer-in-the-headlight looks. Uh, I went and asked some operational folks, and I got the same thing. So something needed to change. So we took 286 pages and we turned it into 18 pages. We went from one or three volumes down to one volume. Guess what? People are reading our doctrine now because you can read it fairly quickly. Yeah, it's not as robust as some of the other ones, but we have annexes you can go to for other people that need to get deep into one area. And then we were prevented writing from some certain concepts because we didn't have the lessons learned and the best practices on certain things, like a thing called ACE, you know, Agile Combat Employment. We hadn't really done it, gotten lessons learned, so we were afraid to put it in there. And we, I talked to my boss, Chief Staff uh, Brown, and he said, hey, we can use doctrine as a forcing function. Let's put out a doctrine note, which Air Force never had done that, the Joint Staff had, which is just, hey, here's an idea on, I'll just use the topic ACE, Agile Combat Employment. We know we're going to be maybe 50, 60% right on best practices, but let's get it out there. We'll do some exercises, and then we'll go back to the LeMay Center, and we can refine it, and we can, you know, get it to the 80% solution, and then keep going after that. Uh, and hence, we're advancing, I think, a little bit quicker on ACE uh, than we have before. And, when a Chum talked about the integrated air and missile defense systems that we have here in Europe, that they're not that great and we need to improve them, uh, he's exactly right. Because of, you talked about the precision weapons that Russia has. Um, they don't have air superiority, but they do have bombers that can launch uh, cruise missiles. They have ships that can shoot caliber missiles, and they're fairly precise. Now, the Ukraine's done a great job of taking a lot of those down. They take probably about 70, 80 percent of the missiles that are coming in. Uh, they take them down before they hit their, their targets, which is typically infrastructure, largely because of what all these nations here have done and what we've provided them in the way of training as well as equipment to shoot those missiles down. Uh, the other thing that you talked about was robotics. They didn't really have a lot when it came to this, but Iran did, so they bought it from Iran. 
So really, the way they strike Ukraine now, the way they will strike us in the future, is through cruise missiles and th that are precise and through uh, one-way UAVs like the Shahib 136. That's why we need to get our IMD uh, level up. But even if we do, we're still going to have that 15, 20% that get through. And those 15 to 20 percent that get through, what we used to do to save our aircraft was on a particular air, air, airport, air base, we would disperse our aircraft around and we'd put barriers in between them so one wouldn't cause a chain reaction and we'd lose everything. That's not good enough now with the precision that our adversary has. So now we have to disperse our aircraft amongst airfields not just amongst an airfield, but through different airfields, which means we have to make sure that all those airfields um, have all the capabilities that we need when it comes to fuel, when it comes to munitions, when it comes to age equipment to fix the aircraft, et cetera. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to make happen. Uh, but we were a lot better, of it, better at it 30 years ago than we are right now. Uh, so we're getting after that, and uh, agile combat employment is now a doctrinal thing that we have in the United States Air Force. So that will help us out. Another thing that we need to do, you know, you talked about, hey, we need air superiority. We need counter IADs to get air superiority. Uh, we need IAMD. How are we going to get there? We can't get there if we don't share information. Uh, we have to use information sharing uh, because that is free. And let me give you an example. Um, when the Ukraine war started, we were averaging, we, the United States, were giving NATO approximately 30 points of interest uh, a month. And that wasn't enough when uh, we started, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, we needed uh, to get more information out. And my predecessor, Cobra Harrigan, who's here somewhere, was able to work with General Walters and get a policy change in the US that allowed us to share information off satellites that we previously haven't been able to share. And we took that 30 points of interest and we turned it into 3,000 points of interest a month in less than about five months. You know how much that cost us? Zero. Zero. It was a signature and a policy change. We cannot just do that with those things, and it can't be just the US. It needs to be everybody, because everybody has something to bring. But not other nations know what you have to bring. And if we can all do this, I'm trying to do it in my country, and I know I've charged all the air chiefs to do it in their country. If we can do this at earnest, we can increase our capability and handle something like IAMD, which kind of seems like uh, unobtainium right now because it's expensive and everything, but if we share radar pictures, if we use integration by design, meaning we buy equipment that we already know is going to integrate into the entire IAMD structure of Europe, and we don't individually buy stuff <laughs> and then pay to make all that individual stuff interoperable later, so we pay twice that way. If we integrate it by design, then it's already interoperable when we buy it and we don't have to, in essence, buy it twice. Easier said than done. Uh, but that's something that we're tackling on both of our sides, uh, and it's going to take all of us to make that happen. Thank you very much. I would be curious to have your take on the question I addressed earlier on air dominance and the consequences of uh, the, the, the Ukraine war. Um, and just as a reminder, do you think it means that air dominance is crucial in the offensive to come? Or is it an acknowledgement that air defense has taken a decisive priority? Yes, it, it's absolutely crucial that we have air superiority. Think of this, if Russia really went after the IADs and they were able to get air superiority, all the equipment that 45 different nations supplied the Ukraine that crossed over Poland or Romania 
would have been dead on arrival because as soon as it crossed the border, there would have been a, cast, a close air support over the top and it would have killed it before it got there. So that's why it's important. Now, it's a hard to get. Yeah. It's hard for you know, the NATO nation to try to do counter IADS missions. Uh, we're starting to practice them all the time, um, but we got to get better at it. And it's more than just fourth gen, it's more than just fifth gen. It's systems of systems, it's multi-domain operations, it's involving ATACMs with the Army, it's involving the Navy, special operations for helping us do it, space support um, to, to do things that, that aid in, in taking down an IADS as well as cyber attacks. I mean, it's across the board, uh, a lot of folks that are involved to make this happen. And I think a lot of people are getting, when we talk with the next generation air dominance fighter and having some CCA collaborative combat aircraft, those, that's systems of systems that's designed to get after this. Mm. But that's often the future. We need to make sure that we have this now so if we invoke Article 5, we're ready and we can get air superiority and we can make sure that what's happening in the Ukraine and Russia fight where we got 300,000 casualties, the West, they won't accept that. Thank you very much. I, rem I remind the public you still have 10 minutes to cast your votes, and I'm going to move to General Ushikura with a question on Japan's new defense policy. It's a pleasure to have this, age, this region of the world represented here. Thank you for being with us. It will allow us also to talk a bit about China and not only Russia, because we do have two uh, theaters uh, uh, that are um, of interest to uh, our militaries. I would like to ask you, General, in the context of the strategic environment in the Indo-Pacific, can you please tell us uh, what are the missions and capabilities that are emphasized in Japan's recently formulated uh, strategy and doctrine, but also the main points of collab collaboration and cooperation uh, with allies and with NATO? Dr. Saramo, thank you very much for asking great question. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the 100 years anniversary of Italian Air Force. It is my great honor and pleasure to be invited to this special occasion and be part of this distinguished panel. Um, this is my second visit to Rome. What is coincident that today, in 2016, I was receiving the certificate from the commandant of NATO Defense College. <laughs> I was so stimulated by and inspired by intellectual discussion up there and fascinated by wonderful people and a lot of historic architecture. Thinking of current harsh environment in Ukraine, there is no wonder that many of you might have been focusing on Ukraine, but today I hope I can provide you with a vision and on the uh, Indo-Pacific, which has become increasingly critical in recent years. Before describing the doctrine, I'd like to give you a quick overview regarding the security environment of Indo-Pacific region. In a nutshell, we have been tested and challenged by China, North Korea, and Russia at sea and in air on a daily basis. First, we recognize that Russia's aggression on Ukraine is an attempt to unilaterally change the status quo by force, and it is a serious situation that shakes the foundation of the international order. Moreover, Russia has been increasing its operational tempo in the vicinity of Japan. Russia militarily trained in the Indo-Pacific, including Japan, along with its moves to strengthen strategic collaboration with China, pose strong security concern. In November last year, Russia and China bomber, con bomber conducted fifth joint patrol around Japan. Such actions are clearly intended to be a demonstration against Japan and are of grave concern for Japan's national security. Turning to China, China has been continuing its attempt to unilaterally change the status quo by force. Her current external stance and military trends are serious concern to Japan and the international community and present the greatest strategic challenge ever. Move on to North Korea. 
North Korea has repeatedly launched ballistic missiles. Back to past three years, we had to respond to roughly 50 times incoming ballistic missile. Development of nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles seriously undermines the peace and security in the region, the international community. Such military trend of North Korea pose an even more grave and imminent threat to Japan's security. In terms of quick reaction alert, in past three years, we had to launch more than 2,000 2, QRA to incoming air breathing target. Thus, no single nation alone can handle this complex and challenging contested strategic environment in the Indo-Pacific. Therefore, it is necessary to build a greater Japan-US relationship and a multilateral cooperation posture with like-minded partners. Here, the key question arises, how best can we improve our interoperability and cooperation posture? Based upon my 35-year-long experience in the service, I came up with the philosophy as follows. Robust military partnership must be underpinned by three pillars, such as strategic alignment, doctrinal alignment, and human interoperability. First, I will describe strategic alignment. Last year, government of Japan has revised national security strategy, NSS, and uh, formulated national defense strategy, NDS, for the first time. These two strategic documents underscore the significance of cooperation with allies and like-minded countries. Both new way of warfare and uh, adversaries' capabilities are critical focal points. Let's take a close look at the situation in Ukraine. Its aggression, Russia's aggression, is a combination, it's not only traditional weapons, such as fighter jet, naval vessels, and tanks, but also asymmetric attacks using large-scale missile strike, UAVs, drones, and information warfare. In other words, saturating attack and salvo attack has changed from planning scenario to operational reality. We recognize that whether we can adopt ourselves to such new way of warfare is a major issue in protecting Japan. Regarding large-scale missile strike, it is necessary to intercept incoming missiles and prevent them from landing in Japan. In addition to restricting the adversary's missile launch and making it difficult to carry out missile strike, it is also necessary to fight tenaciously if a missile strike by minimizing damages and restoring of facilities and runways as quickly as possible. There are seven key capabilities to be fundamentally reinforced, which are standoff capabilities, IAMD, unmanned capabilities, cross-domain operation, C2 and ISO, dispersion, protection, civil protection, sustainability, and resiliency. Second, let me move on to the doctrine. Now that uh, NSS and NDS have brought us strategic alignment, it is time for us to accelerate doctrinal alignment. To do so, line of effort ranging from strategic level to tactical level need to be accomplished. Along with the strategic document, division of current doctrine is underway. Sharpness, multi-connectivity, agility, robustness, tailored capabilities will be emphasized. However, from the perspective of operators at the front line, as General Hecker mentioned, updating tactics, techniques, and procedures, TTP, is even more urgent issue than revision of written document. Back in the year of 20, 2016, Royal Air Force deployed a typhoon to Japan and conducted bilateral training for the first time. 
through the epoch making event, we came to realize that, that many years of training and exercise with US forces and Royal Australian Air Force have made us interoperable with NATO members. In addition to that, having common platform such as F-35, KC-767, and Future Fighter would leverage interoperability and facilitate the standardization of TTPs among user countries. Network connectivity, in other words, plug-in fight architecture is another game changer of interoperability. Data link connectivity strongly helps us overcome capability gap, language barrier, cultural difference, and allows us to work closely together in the battle space in a mutually complemented manner. Third, human interoperability is another key to success. Speaking of interoperability, people tend to think system to system integration, tend to think uh, system to system integration. Most importantly, a uh, more importantly, people to people relationship remains essential. The world where we currently live in is called network age or digitalized society. No matter where we are, we easily reach out our friends by digital tools. However, face-to-face -face interaction remains significant. That's why I'm here in Italy. International Flight Training School, IFTS, is an ongoing great example. Italian Air Force has kindly accepted Japanese student pilot into IFTS for the first time. I am confident that those young pilots will play a key role as an interoperability enabler, not only between Italy and Japan, also among all participating countries. Similarly, key leadership engagement has been enlarging too. In 2016, Lieutenant General Caputo, Vice Chief of Italian Air Force, visited Japan, shared the view of Italian Air Force. German Air Chief Lieutenant General Gerhardt visited Japan last fall, exactly speaking, landed nearby Tokyo by his own Eurofighter. Former Air Chief of Japan attended NATO Partner Air Chief Conference two years in a row online. Amazingly, in January this year, NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg kindly visited our air base and encouraged our airmen and women. His visit to Japan demonstrated NATO's strong will and uh, commitment in Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Thus, partnership between NATO and Japan has been getting closer and closer. Finally, let me provide you with my beliefs regarding doctrine. Doctrine remains one of the crucial pillars to deepen mutual understanding and enhance interoperability. Doctrine should be a living document so that it can be adopted to ever and rapidly changing security environment and technological innovation in a timely manner. Doctrine will provide a bridge between the Atlantic and Indo-Pacific. I'd like to conclude my speech by introducing my favorite military quote, the more we sweat in peacetime, the less we bleed in wartime. Let's stay connected and train hard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such a comprehensive account uh, on the configuration uh, of uh, uh, the region in which Japan is situated and including also elements of strategic and doctrinal alignment was very useful uh, uh, for our discussion. Our time is up uh, for the first part of the panel and I would like to call on the screen the results of the survey that we have launched in the very beginning of the panel. You see a crushing majority. Well, in, in the democratic world, 62% is definitely a crushing majority uh, of uh, a response that says that a new mindset 
is what is needed uh, for um, an effective multi-domain uh, operations. It is the real enabler for MDOs. I would like to give an opportunity to everyone on the panel to comment this result and tell us what you think about it before uh, asking some follow-up questions. Um, uh, Greg, do you want to start? Um, I personally voted for the new mindset, so I'm part of the crushing majority. Um, so I think that the new mindset is, implies thinking in a new way and writing in a, a new doctrine. Um, we are very good, we've heard consensus about that at what we do now, at what we share, but um, we will need much more than the notes we mentioned before about, uh, I think it was airlift, to wade into a completely new mindset. So we're going to face the challenge of introducing the new technology and uh, thinking what we want to do about it and correcting it in a very short cycle and try to get it out to users very quickly and, of course, to um, convince every other stakeholder that we know what we're doing. So it's easy to say we need a new mindset, but it's going to require juggling a lot of balls at the same time. And that's going to bring us, I think, out of our comfort zone, because uh, if it's multi-domain, it also means implicitly multi-service. Nobody wants to speak of a leading service that's just 44%. Nobody wants a multi-domain service, 13%. Yes, that means convincing everybody else uh, to buy into the new vision. We're not going to be able to create this new mindset by ourselves. I mean, if it were the five of us here at the table, it would probably be done very quickly. Uh, it's going to be a lot more complex. So I see that as a significant challenge Thank you very much. Uh, Generali, what do you put behind a new mindset? How would you understand this? Well, first of all, I would have voted exactly the same. So, uh, because the, the A solution is the only one which is not a tool, which is not a solution. Mm -hmm. So again, we have to frame the problem. So a new mindset means basically, so getting rid of the idea that multi-domain is more than one domain or putting three or four domains together. Mm -hmm. This is not all about that. I mean, it's, it's something which is completely different. Uh, Multi-domain means the capacity to understand exactly what each and every domain can bring to the ball in order to deliver the right effect at the right time, in the right moment. Yeah. And that, that, that's all about that. So new mindset mean, means basically uh, working on, on competence, on respect, mutual respect, uh, and trying to understand exactly what is the real capacity that can be offered. Uh, our idea of multi-domain is that the, the service who can bring more, more troops to the fight tend to, tend to stamp over the others and say, okay, we do it our way because we, we have the leading, the leading uh, mindset, which is, which is completely wrong. So I think that we should work a lot, and there's an ongoing debate on this multi-domain. So everybody's talking about multi-domain, but the concept has not been framed clearly yet. Yeah. So we keep talking about that because we understand that in a peer competitor capable of launching hypersonic missiles at, at your home directly, uh, if you don't have the speed, the mindset to react in a swift way, then, then you will be, you'll be losing the fight. So I think that the, there's a lot to be done there besides the good and fancy ideas. Yeah. Tom. Yeah, um, so let me be the outlier. Uh, I voted for a new command and control slash battle management system. And I'll let Cobra talk about this because he'll have the doctrine on it, but uh, those aren't the same thing, by the way. Mm. Those are two different things in one line. The reason why I voted for that one, um, people get that we have to do IAMD, but we don't have, we're missing that tool. And what we have right now in NATO, as far as NATO operational, is a legacy patchwork of systems. Now we have under contract a new system it's been under contract for 25 years, and it's not operational in NATO. I think for the 27 air chiefs out there, if you were given this as a task, and after 25 years it wasn't operational, 25 years and 3 billion euros, you might not have a job the next day. So, but it's NATO, so it's a different world. We need something to connect things, and as Scorch said, we need something that lets us share information, because that's what IAMD is, and the integrated part means one plus one doesn't equal two. 
it e equals 4, 8, or 20. And that's where we need to get to. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I'm kind of in between the two, quite honestly. Um, I think you need a new mindset to do this. I think you need a new mindset to envision the command and control structure that's needed for this. And you need a new mindset to envision a battle management structure that's needed to do this. So I think they kind of go hand in hand, um, but probably the new mindset is a little bit because that's required to get the other stuff done uh, as well. Um, the good news is I think the discussion's happening. You know, people are talking about this. Uh, we've done some doctrine at Maxwell about this. Um, here's the hard part. You know, we can do this in the Air Force, uh, and then maybe we can do it with our other uh, partners, um, with our other services in the United States, but trying to do this with all services you know, its shape with all 31 nations and get them to all agree to this is very difficult. You know, it's kind of like the IAMD, you know. We all know what needs to be happened. Uh, we all agree, I think, with integration by design, mm -hmm. but something hangs, hangs us up on it. And let me just give a quick example. There's a, there's a, a thing that Germany put forward uh, called Sky Shield, uh, and it, was signed by, I think we're up to 17 nations, have agreed with this, and it takes, you know, here's how we have to do IMD, and here's, you know, the shore ad portion, here's, you know, for airplanes, uh, and here's for ballistic missiles. And quite honestly, getting 17 people to sign up for that is pretty, pretty good. Uh, the reason we don't have 31 is because it kind of lists what the systems are, and some people don't want to use those systems, um, and they want to use another system because their country produces it. All the things that you would think. So maybe we take, instead of putting actual systems, we put requirements and we require open architecture. We require this capability from the missile or whatever is gonna be doing this. Uh, and if we can do that, and then all the nations can buy what they want to make sure that we uh, cover the capabilities that are needed, uh, then maybe we're okay. General, uh, just because we only have two minutes to go, I want to combine your reaction to the survey with uh, the necessity for Japan to have a technology-first military doctrine. How do you see the strategic benefits of it? Um, I would love to have a minute on each of these questions from you. Thank you for asking another great question. Uh, if, I look, if I foresee the 2035, uh, Mars domain operation will be oper operational standard. Mm -hmm. All domain will be interconnected. Every single domain will be more contested. So to make all domain operation in more effective, uh, we have to bring our strong point together. And we have to uh, get rid of our mindset, uh, service-oriented mindset. That's my answer. Thank you. All right, we still have one minute, and the question that I um, was highlighting towards, the strategic benefits of a technology-first military doctrine is important, especially for countries that do not have uh, the mass uh, of men, for instance, of uh, uh, military uh, uh, officers. Anyone would like to tell me how they think technology, and yesterday we had an extraordinary panel uh, also on, on the industry, right? There is a lot to do in terms of combining uh, efforts from the private sector and uh, uh, the military. What type of doctrinal changes that leads effectively to have technology at the heart and technology strong militaries on the one hand as a priority and to be able to integrate the private sector uh, uh, in, in an increasing way? I don't know if, um, Tom, you'd like to take a chance on that. Um, well, I'll just make a comment given Ukraine. Uh, if it weren't for Starlink, um, SpaceX and Microsoft, Ukraine wouldn't be standing right now. Mm. We have to figure out how to meld uh, commercial capabilities, private sector capabilities with what we do in wartime. It's a reality. 
and so we need to get better at that. So I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, time is up, two seconds to go. Just the time for me to ask you to join me for a huge round of applause for our panel. I enjoyed so much discussing with you.